Hello, and thank you for tuning in to First Baptist Church of Conway. I'm Rocky Taylor, one of the pastors here, and it is our prayer that this video will be a resource to help you grow in faith in Jesus and to know His love for you. While we are glad to provide this sermon video, let me remind you that it's not a substitute for being a part of the weekly fellowship of believers with whom you can worship and share life. I hope to see you here next Sunday at 10 a.m. May God bless you as you remain faithful to Him. Well, good morning. I'm glad to be here with you as we continue our series studying and looking at the life of David. Last week we talked about and learned about the humble beginnings of David where when David comes on the scene, it's a time of transition for the nation of Israel. Saul has been their king, but he hasn't been following God's command. And so God says he's done with king, uh, um, Saul as king and tells Samuel to go anoint the new one. And that is, of course, David. But when Samuel goes to Bethlehem and tells Jesse, David's father, why he's there, he has this special sacrifice, this special meal, and tells him to bring all his sons at, this, at his house so they can anoint the next king. And remember, turns out, they didn't bring David. They brought all of his other brothers to come, and Samuel said none of them are him. So they had to go fetch David from the field. And it turns out, although his family didn't believe in him, God had chosen David before he'd done anything special for this position to be the king. And what we learned and talked about last week is that God's grace is an amazing thing. He chose us before we could do anything special to earn his favor, to earn his grace. Through Jesus Christ, he invites us all to participate in what he's doing in this world. And what happens next in the story can be, for some of us, perhaps the most difficult part of the story, of our relationship with God. You see, David was called to wait. He was chosen for a special task, but it didn't mean right now it was going to happen. And what we're going to see through the story this morning is a principle. I love how Charles Stanley puts it, so we're going to use what he says, that God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. And waiting for me, I don't know about you, but waiting for me isn't particularly something I'm very good at. How many of you are good at waiting? None of us, a couple of us. Andrew, no, you're not. Okay. <laughs> We're lying in church. We'll do that. We'll talk about that next week. When I finally accepted, as I told you last week, my calling into ministry, finally accepted that God was going to use me to teach and, and lead in ministry in some capacity. And while I didn't know the context, I started school and I knew, I knew exactly what I needed to do next. In order to learn about ministry, I needed to work full time in ministry. I mean, it just makes sense, right? If I'm going to pastor, I need experience being a pastor. But for various reasons, I couldn't find a full-time vocational uh, ministry job, right? Because I didn't have the education or experience. Like looking back, it's like, oh, okay, it kind of makes sense. But instead of God using me in that, he ended up having me become a general manager of a business. In 2008, right? In 2008, the economy was, was done or almost done, right? The Great Recession was alive. And I became a general manager of a business who lost 50% of its revenue at the time I got there. And the entire time I was a general manager, I complained. The entire time I was finishing up school and I knew that God had forgotten about me. I knew he didn't know what he was doing. I'm just being honest with you. I knew that it was pointless for me to be in business because I was going to pastor. Why in the world did I need to learn to run a business? Business principles have nothing to do with ministry. Why did I need to understand budgeting and accounting, revenue and expenses? Churches don't deal with that kind of stuff. <laughs> Why did I know how to manage 30 employees? Pastors don't do things like that. They don't manage people. They don't deal with that kind of stuff. Why did I need to learn how to deal with offsite owners? Right, The owners who were in charge barely came in, and I was accountable and responsible for reporting to people that weren't around that much. 
Like pastors never do things like that. Why was I responsible to try to figure out how to run a turnaround situation? Churches never deal with that. And why did I have to learn how to deal with disgruntled customers? In the church world, nobody's like that. Why? I would never feel any of those pressures I just knew in ministry. Nothing that I was doing in real life was going to do anything when I became a pastor. I just knew what I was supposed to do, and I knew, and I'm serious, I was a little arrogant, maybe a little bit. I knew God had no idea what he was doing in my life. Instead of having me become a, an associate pastor some role, God had me be in business for five and a half years. And instead of just being in ministry, I had to seek out mentors and learn from people who were doing it and learn and develop some other skills. And I look back on it, of course, as you did, I chuckle. But I knew I was wasting my time. I knew learning humility and learning to be patient wasn't something I needed. My time was now because I was 23 years old and I knew everything. Y'all ever been there at 23? Yeah, some of y'all are still there. Okay, I'm just letting you know. You don't know everything. But embarrassingly, this entire time, all I did, I'm serious, it's embarrassing, I complained and I fussed. Waiting isn't easy. But what I learned is that if he would have done what I wanted him to do, I wouldn't have been nearly prepared for the job and the positions that he would call me to. It turns out that God knew more than me. And it turns out that knowing God's will is important, but understanding God's timing is just as important. Because how do you do with waiting on God? How do you do with seeking his timing rather than your own? Are you humble during the process? Do you take that time to look inwardly, look at your character, develop those traits, or do you complain? How do you deal with uncertainty, the uncertainty of life? How do you do with not getting that job, not getting that relationship, being overlooked? When you know it's supposed to be you and you know it's supposed to be you and you just know it and you know it, but God's saying not yet. How do you deal with those things? In fact, what do you think God is doing while you are waiting? By no means, as I told you, am I an expert on this. But what I've often found is when we think we're waiting on God, more often than not, he's actually waiting on, on us. There are things that we need to develop. There are things that we need to do. There are things that we need to work on. But every single one of us will have to wait on the Lord. I mean, it is commanded throughout the scriptures. And so today we're going to look at this, we're going to unpack this time of David's life. We're going to unpack it as we go and look at this waiting. And it's a little different because at the end I have an application point for the entire church as a whole. But here's where we're at. After David was anointing, uh, excuse me, anointed, God was working to prepare the stage for David. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 13. This is the verse we ended on. It says, so David stood there among his brothers... Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought, uh, brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. Look at verse 14. Here we go. It says, now the spirit of the Lord had what? Left Saul. This is important. And the Lord sent a tormenting spirit. It's going to mess some of us up, isn't it? He sent him a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. And of course, the author has these right next to each other. The Lord was clearly with David now and no longer with Saul. And the thing that probably shakes our theology just a little bit is this idea of God sending a tormenting spirit to Saul. But this shouldn't shake us. This shouldn't bother us unless we have a bad understanding of who God is. You see, God in his mercy sent this tormenting spirit to Saul. You say, Brian, that doesn't sound very merciful to me. That, that doesn't sound very, very good at all. Like, what do you mean God's merciful? What do you mean this is out of his mercy? 
Listen, this is absolutely out of his mercy and his grace. He sent this tormenting spirit to Saul because Saul wasn't obeying God. Saul was supposed to be the king that represented all of God's interest and leading people. Now remember, we have to understand this. When a king messes up, do people die? Absolutely. Can a king lead people in a war that shouldn't be at war? Yeah, I mean, think about it. This is a king, all sorts of things happen. And so he's supposed to be the representative um, for the people about God's leadership. And so instead of God instantly just killing him, he sends him a spirit to let him know what you're doing, how you're behaving is not okay. What you're doing, how you're behaving is not okay. And Saul would have known that things were different. And check this out, for the next 12 years, approximately 12 years of Saul's life is completely and utterly miserable. Because he's not paying attention to what God is calling him attention to. You see, the spirit of God, he should have known that, that God has left his presence, that something's not right. And instead of having this peace that only God can give us, he's filled with fear. He's filled with depression, like something's missing in his life. And instead of taking the time to search his own heart, he tries to fix the symptoms rather than deal with the problem. Have you ever considered, I mean, is it even on your radar that God is trying to get your attention in a similar way? Are you caught up in sin, caught up in looking at that stuff, caught up in saying those things, acting that way? Are you caught up in that, claiming to be a child of God, claiming the blood of Jesus has cleansed your sins, but you were choosing to live in and be a part of this sinful thing? And listen, what we have to learn is God's not going to let us be at peace in that. He won't let you feel good and think it's okay. God's going to want you to deal with that. And have you ever considered the reason why you feel scared? The reason why you're a little depressed? The reason why that thing going on, you know that's not okay. Maybe it's a symptom of some sin. And God's trying to call your attention to. And listen, I'm not trying to diagnose anyone here. I'm not trying to pretend to be that type of person. But I do ask you to consider that perhaps those uneasy feelings, that fear, maybe some of that depression, maybe some of that loneliness, maybe God's trying to get your attention and say, hey, you need to quit this. This isn't okay. Come back to me. You see, I love this quote. Look at what this one gentleman says. He says this. He said, while Saul was free to make his own choices, we're able to do that, right? All right, you're with me. He did not have similar control over the consequences of his actions. Isn't that true? We have control over what we do, but we can't control what happens after we do it. He says, in many ways, choices make us who we are. Saul's disobedient led to his torment and this is so important for us to understand because Saul knows something is different, but he doesn't ask God about it. You know why? I think it's because he doesn't want to know why. He doesn't want to listen to what God has to say because he's already been told the kingdom will not last. He's already been told that another person's going to be king. And instead of following God, instead of trying to experience the blessing and peace that comes from him, he does things his own way. Look at verse 15. And it says, some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. His servants like, hey, look, this is from God. Why don't you deal with that? Why don't you go to him? Why don't you work that out? Why don't you repent? Well, hey, Saul, look, this is from God. Why don't you do it? He's like, no, no, let's not deal with that. He said, let us find you a good musician. Let's just play some music. Like music will solve it. Don't worry about God. Let's just play music instead. To play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. Well, I wonder who that's going to be, right? Who's this harp player going to be? But notice, someone else had to point out to Saul what was going on. He knew what was going on, but instead of going to God, instead of dealing with that, 
He continues to just try to deal with the symptoms. You see, God was waiting on Saul. Saul had an amazing opportunity, and he chose to ignore it. Look at verse 18. It says, one of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is talented hard player. Not only that, he's brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He's also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. This is how we know times passed, because after David was anointed, he had to wait. He went back to the field. He went working with dad. He didn't immediately become king. He just had to go back and do what he was doing. But time has passed, and look at the reputation David develops. Evidently, he's growing in abilities. He went from this guy whose dad didn't even trust him to now there's rumors and his reputation precedes him that David's this great man, this great warrior. He's brave, not even in the army. I don't know how they know all this, but this is his reputation now. And evidently, look, pay attention, especially if you're younger. Evidently, God can do some pretty amazing things. Evidently, he can increase your influence. Did you know that God is more powerful than social media? Did you know you don't have to be a complete fool online, post half-naked pictures to get the attention of people? Do you know like God can increase your influence? You can actually keep your head down, do the right things, and then God can lift you up in due time. God can bring you to where you need to be. You don't have to create that on your own. Look at verse 19. It says, so Saul sent messages to Jesse saying, send me your son, David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, wine skin full of wine. So Saul sends for David. Jesse does, which is David's dad, does what anybody would do in that situation. He says, all right, hey, go serve the king. Verse 21. So David went to Saul and began serving him. And Saul loved David very much. Folks, that's going to change here in a few weeks. It's going to change quickly. But he loves him. And David became his armor bearer, this trusted close position. And then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, please let David remain in my service for I'm very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp and then Saul would feel better and the tormenting spirit would go away. So David became an armor bearer, the trusted allied position very close to the king. Check this out. He's able to see the ins and out of the kingdom. He's able to see the front row seats to what it looks like to be in charge without, without feeling any of the pressure. He's able to see palace life. He's able to see how decisions are made. He's getting a front row seat to his job one day. He's sitting there in training. But look at Saul. The music is comforting him. But what he should have seen is that the music was pointing him to something else. You see, Saul knew that David was somebody special. But rather than seeking the Lord, investigating what this might be, and rather than hearing from the Lord what's happening, he continued to do things his own way and use David for his pleasures and getting rid of that spirit. And you see the anointed prince is humbly playing the harp, comforting the one who's the king. And let's be honest, how many of us would be in David's position saying, Now, wait a minute. God said, I'm supposed to be the king. See all that money, all that power, all that influence? That's supposed to be mine. Like, God literally already told me this is supposed to be mine. Not David. Just waits, plays the harp, enjoys life, sees what's going on. Now, that's the end of chapter 16, and the story transitions in chapter 17 to probably one of the most well-known Bible stories. Most of you have heard it, even if you didn't grow up in church. You see, Israel's at war. It transitions into war camp. Israel's being taunted by this very large man named... Y'all are following along today. I'm proud. Yeah, Goliath, who's who's part of the arch enemies of Israel, the, the Philistines. 
And the two armies are camped out, ready for war. But like any war, nobody really wants to go to war and die. Like that's not something people want to do. So they're both like camped out, thinking about fighting, wanting to fight. And Goliath would come out, this behemoth of a man, and said, listen, how about this? Instead of our people going to war and all these people dying, I'll fight one of your people. I'm the biggest, I'm the baddest. I'll fight one of you guys, one of your people, Israel. You send him out and whoever wins, wins the whole thing. Like, let's save some lives. Let's have the biggest and the baddest go against each other and settle this whole thing. And now, who have we already been told was the tallest and biggest in Israel? Do you remember? Saul, the king, right? Remember, head and shoulders above everybody else. And so what I learned from this story, Saul's the tallest. What we get is tall people are either evil or afraid. <laughs> just another good, helpful wisdom insight here. I don't, I don't know what this is just here. Because they're afraid. It says when Goliath is taunting Israel, it says they were all, including Saul, terrified and deeply shaken. Next week, a short guy is going to come on the scene and fix this. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> but who's going to be, right? This is what the story is getting at. Who's going to be the one to risk it all? Who's going to be the one to try to potentially give up their life for the benefit of everybody else? Who, who's this one person that's willing to risk their life to save everyone? Going back to the story, verse 14. It says, David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. So check this out. It gives us an insight to David. Even though David was at the king's service, right? Remember, Saul said, hey, let David just hang out and stay with me. Even though he was there in the palace enjoying life, the youngest son would still go back home to help dad. This isn't his responsibility. He's not the oldest. He's not the biggest. This, this isn't who he is. But instead of just focusing on himself, he goes back to help the family. The anointed prince, the one everyone looks down on, is still serving his family. And look what his father asked him to do. It says, for 40 days, every morning and every evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israel army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. He's being a gopher. Like, I know your reputation doesn't matter. Hey, just go take some bread. Like, that's all you're good for, David. And give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they were doing. So David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah and fighting against the Philistines. So though David's reputation had become this brave warrior, he's chosen to be a gopher. Let's be honest. How many of you would complain about that? Yeah, just one of us, two, two, three. Yeah, yeah. But like, what are you talking? Like, I'm, su I'm supposed to be the next king and I'm delivering cheese and bread. This is what, like, I'm just gonna report back to you what's going on. This is David's season of waiting. They seem unimportant tasks. They don't seem like it's doing anything. It doesn't seem like God's working at all. He's just delivering bread. But we know that God is setting the stage. I don't want to ruin for you next week what happens. You'll have to come back and we'll go over it. But through this story, we learn something very important about God. We learn that he is very likely, likely going to call us in a to season of waiting. Although he's called David to this great position, although he's empowered David, David had to wait on the Lord's timing for the Lord's will. David doesn't try to force things. He doesn't try to make it happen. He doesn't go up to the palace after he's anointing and telling, so look, I have this message from the Lord. You got to go. He simply waits. And he's positioned exactly where he needs to be to be thrusted on the scene so the whole nation can find out he is the great warrior king. And so what we learn is that God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. This entire time, David's waiting, but God was moving. 
Isaiah 64, 4 says, you should put this to memory, it's a good one. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. When you're waiting, God is working. And this is what we see David doing, waiting on the Lord, which is exactly what Saul didn't do. We didn't, have, we didn't look at Saul's life, but if you're familiar with the story, remember, Saul would make decisions based on his own logic, his own selfish desires. The last straw that had it where God said, I'm removing you as king, is when he was told to wait before he made the sacrifice, that Samuel would come and do it. But Saul got impatient. He explained it through logic. He said, you know what? We need to do this. We need to get about going to war. Let's just go ahead and take care of this on my own timing. And because he got ahead of the Lord, he got removed from being king. And so what we need to be confident in is that in our seasons of waiting, which are not fun, God is preparing something for us. That God is working on our behalf, getting things ready, getting things prepared for that next season of life for us. Psalms 27, David tells us this. This is what he knew. He says, wait patiently. It's one thing to wait. It's another thing to be patient about it, right? Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. You see, it takes bravery and it takes courage to wait upon the Lord. David knows, you know, it's not easy to wait. But it's precisely because David was brave, it's precisely because David was courageous, he could indeed patiently wait upon the Lord. Because he didn't need to fulfill those selfish desires running in him. He was good. He's like, look, I'll just carry bread and cheese. Don't matter to me. If that's what God wants me to do, I'll carry bread and cheese. God wants me to play the harp, I'll play the harp. Because this whole idea of him being God, of, of him being the king was whose idea? Whose idea was it him being king, folks? So who was going to make it happen? He's like, yeah, so I'll just carry bread and cheese. I'll do what I got to do. God will do what he's going to do. You see, here's what's important. He wasn't worried about what everyone else said about him. He wasn't worried of his brothers going, oh, look at, look at that anointed prince bring me bread. He wasn't worried about his friends saying, you're just stuck out in that field still. You're not being promoted. What's going on? He's like, ah, God's got me. He'll take care of it. I'll just stay faithful to him. You see, fear will try its best to convince you, to convince me to act and act now. You will hear things like, if you don't act now, you're going to miss it. Do we honestly believe that if we are waiting on the Lord, we're going to miss anything he has for us? Do you think somehow we're going to miss what God wants to give us? All right, God has unlimited resources. How could we miss what he wants to give us? You're going to hear things like, if you don't make it happen, it won't happen. It's all on you. Do we honestly believe we're more powerful than God? Do we honestly believe he needs us for anything? We're going to hear things like, if you don't give them what they want, you'll never find love. Do we honestly believe that God can't take care of that for us? That he can't bring the right person for us? Do we honestly believe hanging out or being with people in sin is going to bring us towards God's best? See, we have to remember that God's timing isn't just good. God's timing is perfect. God has perfect timing. And the key to waiting on God is simply humility. It's recognizing we aren't nearly as important as we think we are. And even if God gives us an amazing mission, like becoming the next king, humility reminds us that it's all because of his grace anyways. It's all because he's called us, he's positioned us, he'll get everything arranged. It's not about us. He simply just wants us to stay faithful. You see, humility was flowing out of the life of David because of his intimate relationship with God. David sought God. 
David wanted to hear from God. David developed this relationship of communion with God so he could hear God when God says wait. He could go when God says go. He made sure to talk with him and work with him through that. David just had humility. He trusted God. He knew God. And we, of course, see from the life of Jesus the ultimate display of humility That the true anointed one humbled himself by becoming obedient to the cross. He took the lowly position of a slave. He served his own created beings by dying a bloody death on the cross. Jesus humbled himself and died for us so we could live. And what happened through all of that? Through the resurrection, remember, he was raised to the highest honor that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Remember, that's Philippians 2. We studied that in our last section, our last series. But this humility, this life of David is pointing to the true humble one, the one who's going to risk it all, the one who's going to actually lay down his life for the ultimate victory for you and for me. And humility is the key characteristic that God wants to develop in you and me. You see, pride? Pride is the chief of all sin, folks. Pride is the sin that tells you you don't need God. Pride's the sin that says, I don't need him. I don't need his people. I'm going to do what I want whenever I want because I got this. You're like, you've heard that before too? We all hear it. Every single one of us are convinced we don't need God at some point in our lives. And we're like, no, no, that's a lie. I better go sit under his teaching. I better go praise him with other people. I better go to my friends and talk about what's going on. All of us deal with that kind of stuff. But we have to recognize, what is it? It's pride. But David was humble. In God's timing, he will elevate us where he wants us. And did you know there's nothing that can stand in God's way if he wants to do something? Because he is God after all. So God acts on behalf of those who what? Go and do it for him. Get it done. Kick down the door. Make it happen. How many of y'all are make it happen type of people in here? All right, this sermon's for you then, okay? Wait on him. And we know hindsight's 2020. But what I wish... I wish in that season of waiting, I could tell you about how awesome I did. About how I just knew it was the Lord telling me to be patient. And about how amazing it was and how I saw these opportunities. And I was able to minister to people out of it rather than calling everybody and complaining all the time. Y'all ever do that? You got to vent to somebody? Your friends are like, man, God needs to do something. I'm not going to be this person's friend. Like something has to happen. God, move, please. But I should have known. I was waiting on the Lord. God is working. God is active. And God is preparing something for you. If you are in a season of waiting, God is preparing something for you. So develop that character. Develop those things he's asked you to develop. Trust him and get ready to move. Seek his guidance. Listen to him and follow him. Now, To close our time together, we're going to transition. I got two sermons in one, two for the price of one in the same time limit. And amen, right? You okay with that? We're going to train up a little bit because I want to speak collectively. There's something here in this story I just have to talk about here because it's too important not to. I want to talk about collectively as the people of God. And right now, I'm specifically talking to those of you who call First Baptist Church Conway your home church. If you're thinking about our church, if you're at our church, this is your church home. This is for you. Because as a church, one thing we are very clear about is that we are called to wait upon the Lord's return. Did y'all know that? We're waiting for the Lord to return? If you didn't know that, I'm glad you're here. Now you know, right? We're waiting for Jesus to come back. But while we're waiting, we're called to be about his mission of making and maturing disciples. And as we see from the life of David, waiting doesn't mean being stagnant. It means being open to what God wants to do through us. We look for opportunities that he presents. Go deliver bread and cheese, go play the harp, whatever it is he leads us to do. 
But what I want you to see in this story, we clearly see that God is bringing about change in the nation of Israel. And for some reason, change is one of the hardest things for the people of God to embrace. But it's one of the very core principles of understanding who God is and who we are. You see, God is the God of change. Follow me now. God never changes, but he is the God that brings change. The entire world speaks to this. Do seasons change or does it always remain the same? Whose idea was that? God. Does it change from day to night? Whose idea was that? Right, so God has developed this change. Do you know God created time and he's put us in time? And every single day as we age, what happens? Oh, y'all aren't following me? We'll go back to the beginning. Right, change, like I don't like where this is going. You need to, this is important. Because just being in time itself means change. We can't freeze it, we can't pause it. God has done this. It's not a bad thing. It's a God thing. God created and put us in this idea of change. In fact, the gospel, the whole message of Jesus Christ is this. I'm going to sum it up real quick. People are wrong and need to what? Repentance means to? Did you know that? The whole message of Jesus is that what you're doing is not okay and you need to change course. You need to follow me. Repentance isn't a one-time deal. Repentance is an ongoing, constant thing in our life, which means God is continually, continually calling you individually to change, to grow, to become more and more like his son. And this isn't just an individual thing. It's a church thing as the people of God. And you see, in this story, we see God is bringing about change to the nation of Israel. Saul didn't seek God because he didn't want to change. He wanted things to stay the exact same way. Although God said he's changing, Saul did everything in his power to keep it the same. Did you know that? Everything in his power. You're about to see, he fights David the whole time. He don't want to change. He's in charge. He wants to be in charge. This is the way God did it before, so it must be how God's going to do it in the future. And God said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm bringing change. And churches somehow get this idea that everything needs to stay the same. But the world changes all around us. And we think the one place that we can control is the church. The one thing that needs to be constant in our lives is the church. And churches often, I'm not talking about here, if it applies, then there it is. But in general, churches try everything in their power to keep things the same. As if somehow in the past, everything was perfect. But that idea baffles me. Because the church is supposed to be the one place that we aren't in control The church is supposed to be the uh, the place under King Jesus who's controlling, directing, and leading. And he has asked us, you and me, to make and mature disciples for him. Now, don't get me wrong. Our message never changes, but our methods are ever-changing. Every generation must work out the gospel in their context. And as the world changes, as society changes, as culture changes, it's every generation's responsible to take the gospel and apply it to their context. Because did you know when you were growing up isn't like how kids now are growing up? I mean, did you know that? Then how could we think we can do the same things to reach them and have the, how, how does that even make sense? That's why they're not coming to churches. That's why they're walking away, because we're not speaking to them. We're not talking to them. We want to keep it the same. But folks, that's not of God. It never has been. 
And let me just say it very plainly. Churches who refuse to change die. It's just a fact. And when God brings revival in a church, it's always through change. A change of heart, a change of leadership, a change of priority. And if God's going to bring revival in this church, which he's working on very clearly, if he's going to bring it in our city, it's going to be through churches who are open to his leadership and his guidance. It will be through churches who are op living open-handedly saying, God, do what you want. This is your thing, not ours. And it will be the churches who understand that no generation is the same. And our calling isn't to be comfortable. Our calling is to be sacrificial for the next generation. To raise them up. To disciple them. And do things that reach them. As a church, please hear me, this is so important. Every generation needs to be creating environments for the next generation. Not the next. Ensuring that the faith is being passed down. Ensuring that the gospel is being relayed in a way they can understand. It's for the next. And imagine if every generation didn't focus on themselves, but focused on the next. What would happen, folks? We'd have intergenerational churches. We wouldn't have a gap between the middle-aged people who think that church doesn't matter anymore. Because nobody took the time to disciple them. And this is important because we are here to honor God. We're not here to honor me as the pastor. We're not here to honor your parents or your grandparents. We are here to glorify God and make disciples for him. And part of maturing as a disciple is giving up for the benefit of other people. Saying it's not about me. It's about you. Now, here's the thing I want you to see from the story. The thing that bothers me more than anything else, and I hope it bothers you. Saul had the opportunity to disciple the second greatest king of Israel. Who's the first? Jesus, right? Told you 85% of the time when you're in church, Jesus is the answer. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Saul had the opportunity to disciple David. David was brought right to him. He knew something was different from David. Saul had the opportunity. His story could have been, I blew it, but I am developing the next generation. I'm going to invest in Saul. We could be reading the life of Saul of this was a time of repentance, a time where he did everything he could to bring David up, to train David, to develop David, to help David. Saul could have been a great story about how to pass your legacy. But he didn't. He rejected it. He tried to keep everything the same. And who do you think won? God did. And he's not known as a man of a great legacy. He's not known as a man who passed on uh, to, to help the next generation. He's known as a man who went kicking and screaming and jumped on a sword to end his life because he was just he was done with it. Like, that's how his legacy is. But right here, God's brought him the heart player. He said, Saul, come, come on. This is it. It can be different. And so as we wait for the Lord's return, let us make sure that God is our priority. Let's make sure his mission of making and maturing disciples is what we need, excuse me, what we are focused on. Because God is the God of change, folks. It's all throughout the scriptures. Will you pray with me?